There's a lot going on in the community right now about what is a real pagan, what is a real witch, what to do with Wiccans and what have you. I'm not one to be overly pedantic and go back to definitions all the time, but I kind of am. So today I would like to discuss what a pagan is, because I don't think a lot of us really know. I don't think that the definition will affect everyone who plays around in the wonderful world of the paganry. I think it might change your views. Let's talk about it as we walk together down creation's paths. Hello everybody, my name is Charlie. I am a Christo Pagan Druid and Priest of Frigid. Hello everyone. My name is Brian. I am old man's feast from chairs. Words have meaning. Uh yeah. Yes do have meaning. I do get that the meaning of words can change. I am not saying that we have to rigidly hold to old meanings of words. I am just saying if we're gonna be fighting amongst ourselves. Maybe we should look at those who are fighting against us, how they use words, and maybe not play their games with them. Maybe? Just a little bit. Might be a smart thing to do. But before we get into all that, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, to whatever the terminology is on the app you're currently listening to us. We do original Christo Pagan and Druid content five days a week, Monday through Friday, on this podcast, so you don't want to miss a thing, because we have a lot of interesting topics lined up for you. All right, got that out of the way. Let's get to it. Everyone's a pagan. Thank you for listening. If um, if you like what you heard, make sure to subscribe, turn on the bell, notification, and end. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it really is that simple. Everyone is pagan. The word pagan is one of many words that has been used over time to explain, to name, to label those who do not follow the Church of Rome and its descendant churches. So originally, they used fun words that don't have any spooky context for the future. They used words like Gentile, but then they decided, oh, like the anti-Semitism, let's not sound Jewish at all. So, you know, they dropped that one. And then they tried nations because that sounds nice and biblical and whatnot. But then they were like, but we're nations. So that's weird. We can't really do that. Then they tried ethnics for a while. I, I'm not kidding. The actual Latin is ethnic key, which is basically ethnic without the C at the end. It's like how your ex can tell you you're a racist while doing a racism without actually confessing you're a racist exactly per se, but your actions have already told you you are. Yeah, like that. that's not like really bad foreshadowing for the future. Yeah. But eventually, sometime in the fourth century, they settled on the word pagan. Pagan meant rural. It's what we would say today with words like Redneck, hill folk, it, it, country folk, country is actually that simple. C country folk. It did have a pejorative sense because Romans like to think of themselves as urban. So you had the urban people and the country people. It already had a quasi negative connotation to it. In the fourth century, it becomes very specifically used for those quaint people that haven't gotten with the new thing yet. By the end of the fourth century, people who are labeled pagans are no longer allowed to hold public office. They are not allowed to write a will. So the state gets all of their property upon their death, the state or the church. They are not allowed to have temples of their own within the Roman empire. Should they happen to engage in a riot because all their rights have been taken away, they have to pay back three or four times what was stolen and or damaged in the riot. Because, yeah, that was happening. By the way, that particular law actually applied to both pagans and Jews because... So if you're already sitting back like me and going, huh, this sounds like ethnic cleansing. Uh, yes, this is a tale as old as time. The trick has taken on different names, but the tactics are still the same. They're still the same. Now, how is this word pagan defined? Pagan was defined as anyone who did not follow the God of the Roman church, the official sanctioned God of the Roman church. Now notice I'm saying Roman, not Roman Catholic here. In fact, many of the old documents do say Roman Catholic. They, they, they do have that word in them. I was surprised to see that. I'm currently working on a book on Christopaganism 
and went back and actually read the Roman law codes. I was surprised to see that word in there so early in the law code. By the way, Catholic was a Latin word that meant the same everywhere. It was one of two words they had for all over the place. You had Omni and you had Catholic. But I was surprised to see that in there. How did they define a pagan? Well, a pagan was, of course, anybody who was still practicing any of the indigenous religions of the region with a carnal for Jews who were hated in their own kind of way and anyone who was seen to disagree with the official church stand on the nature of God, the doctrine or the faith. Heretics were pagans, according to the early church, to the origin of this term. Which gets really weird, because if you go by that definition, even the Catholic church are pagans. This is why we start up by saying everyone's a pagan, because yeah, everybody. the Catholic church changed that definition over time. The first schism. Was, yeah, the first schism. was actually a debate over that very thing. And there's a matter of question of whether one or both or maybe all the above. But the subsequent schisms still all don't fall under the same old definition. And so therefore would pay. This term continues down. At the time of the Reformation, Martin Luther declared everyone who did not follow the Lutheran God that he proclaimed was a pagan. Which means it all gets even more muddy because now it depends on your perspective, thus what your definition of God is, and everybody else is pagan. So therefore, now at that point, everyone really is a pagan. This continues down the line where we see a lot of the other reform movements. The Anglican Church did this as well when they had to burn down the pagan monasteries that existed in their land, <laughs> which, by the way, were the Catholic monasteries that were there because of course anybody who wasn't an Anglican was a pagan. This is a definition that has traveled down the line while it is not a word that is commonly used in a lot of churches today. You rarely hear the Pope, for example, decry the pagans of the world, though, by the way, Pope Francis has actually done that, has have many of the popes before him, doesn't get the press because people aren't sensitive on a large level to the Catholic Church saying bad things about pagans these days, but they're still doing it. When I was coming up in the Baptist church, everyone who wasn't a Baptist was a pagan. That was the word that we used. They would clearly say from the pulpit that the Catholics were pagans, the Presbyterians were pagans. They would go down the list. Lutherans in particular were pagans. Every pastor I had when I was young just had a thing about the Lutherans. Oh, I don't know what it was, but there was a thing there. This is why... The, for me, the first step in decolonizing your thought constructs is in recognizing the definition of pagan as used in common parlance has all these negative connotations because of constructs from imperial structures. I don't mean a imperial church. It started with the imperial church, but then all the other imperial churches and, and everything after that, for those that hear pagan and think, ooh, bad, and that initial knee-jerk reaction, Take a moment and reflect upon that because that is a construct in your own mind that you should destroy. It's and wrong. You don't need to have it. Anyone who says Christians can't be pagans, again, that belies the definition of a term. Heretics are pagans by de definition because they do not worship, quote unquote, true and proper God. The funny thing is, if you put 100 Christians in a room, everyone is a pagan at that point. But we'll come around to some of that math later. Yeah, it's, and I, I want to point this out because this is a pejorative term that is being reclaimed. People who were pagan at the time did not take this name on with a badge of honor. This isn't so, a, a term that is being reclaimed because it was taken away from them. We are reclaiming this word today. Those of us who do work with other pantheons, especially like us with our relationship with the Irish pantheon, not all groups have reclaimed this term. For example, most Norse practitioners prefer the term heathen to pagan, which heathen is the English equivalent of pagan, actually more akin to the Nordic word that was used. English brought in both the Nordic languages. Heathen was most commonly used for Ocean Keltoy phrased it as the obstinate heathens who refused to give up their faith. I believe that's how he worded it. I think it was Sam. I hope I'm not giving that credit to somebody, to, to the wrong person. We have to understand we are reclaiming these terms, whether it's heathen, pagan, any of that. I've seen a lot of people trying to reclaim the word heretic as well. 
and we should. Heretic meant to choose. You see, heresy existed before the church. I, I really, I know this is a bit of a side quest here, but heresy existed before the church. If you grew up in the Greek educational system, which Rome adopted wholesale, at some point you would choose a philosophy, a heresy to follow. Because that's what a heresy was. It was your chosen faith. Now, why did this become a bad thing? Because, well, the truth is obviously self-evident. So if you're doing anything other than the obvious truth, you chose to live in error. Thus, the word heresy gets applied to people who disagree with the imperial church. And also why heretics are lumped into this category. But we are taking these words back. We have to understand their history and origin. Because I see people arguing on social media quite a bit over whether or not Wiccans are pagans. Well, for the most part, Wiccans do not worship the sanctuary god of the churches. So by definition, yes. Like I get wanting to be gatekeepy. I get wanting to be protective. We are a small community. We are a minority faith. And I get those instincts, but we have to be careful where we're setting those gates up especially when we're reclaiming a pejorative term that has been used against us for power. I, I feel this a lot as a queer person. Queer was a word that was used against us and we have reclaimed it and given it meaning and given it such a beautiful meaning and purpose that it is my preferred term of use. I would gatekeep this term, but only from people that aren't LGBTQIA, it's a large spectrum. Like a lot of people yeah. get in, but if cisgender, heterosexual people, I'm sorry, unless you also happen to be demi ace or arrow or transgender or intersexed, you, you don't get on the bus. It's a big gate with a lot of people in, but there's some people that just don't get to come in. I get that. That's what paganism and paganry needs to be a big gate. That's why I like the big gate being set at basically a spirituality that is earth-centered. It sits a big gate because it still honors its roots. It is a more Ooh. more earth-centered where you're in touch with nature, you're in touch with the environment. I like that big gate. I, I think that is fine. I, I often employ that myself. I do think that we need to make room especially with the rise of Christian nationalism. Like we cannot be fighting amongst ourselves as Christian nationalists are literally plotting ways to take away our rights, to make the, the doorway too narrow for people to get in that need to be identified in this group. I would say anyone who, if you are anywhere on the spectrum of not working for or believing in one of the authorized Christian gods, because they all define them slightly differently. They may try to pretend that they don't, but they do. This is a place for you. Remember, Buddhists, Muslims, Shinto, Taoists have all been referred to as pagans. I really think if we're going to try to gatekeep, the, the gatekeep is that you're not part of any of the institutionalized Christian groups. You don't believe in any of those gods. Because I don't know of a pagan or a Christo-pagan that believes in an angry, vengeful sky god that sends people to an eternal hellfire to prove that he loves them. Yet, no, no, that's not the god I believe in. Which is why I make a distinction between what I call a Christo-pagan and a pagan. Because I don't want to make anyone feel like they have to have Jesus in their theology or practice to be considered a pagan. Since I have Jesus included in my paganism, I use the term Christo pagan. I am still pagan. Most of my work, most of my devotional life is dedicated to Angus, to Danu, and to Bridget. The vast majority of it is dedicated to Bridget. I took my priesthood vows to Bridget. But Jesus and Mary and many of the other saints and angels are very much a part of my spirituality and my practice as well. So that to me is why I put not necessarily a division, but a circle within a circle. All Christo-pagans are pagans, but not all pagans are Christo-pagans. That's how we need to see this as a bunch of Venn diagrams. Because under Christo-pagans, there are those like me who practice a form of Irish pagan. So I get a Venn diagram where I'm in the Christo-pagan part over there and I'm in the Irish pagan part over here. Both and 
we, we can have multiple groups inside this bubble. We don't need to be complaining and fighting at e with, with each other about it. Because trust me, there are many groups out there that still want to fight us. If you haven't encountered any of them, you are living a blessed life. You're probably in an urban area. More power to you. Where we live, I don't know what would happen if we went around to introducing ourselves to random people as Hagans. Without even with the, regardless of whether the Christ, the Christ is there or not. I don't even know if this, whether you're in urban or not urban environment. That would even matter, at least in the States, because there are quite a few Hellfire preachers in both urban and non-urban. All of them would quite easily and quickly go, oh, you're evil. I was just trying to make point of if you've never met anybody with an anti-pagan bias, you're probably either in a city or a very pagan community. Yeah. That's the thing too that I've seen is there's that spectrum. You have those that just have that, they, they can't even help themselves. You're evil. They just scream out, burn the, burn the pagan. But then you have a larger spectrum where they have these negative constructs in their head. Through politeness, they might not just blurt it out. But in the back of their head, they're going, wow, they're having a polite conversation with you, but they're leaning back further and further, and they're just trying to get out of there because they've suddenly labeled you as crazy and evil because they have a construct. And that's part of the challenge is getting people to even see that it's there. We just really need to be coming together in solidarity right now. And again, we don't have to agree with each other on everything. That's not what any of this is about. That's very much an imperial church way of thinking that everybody has to agree and be on the same page. I don't really care what another pagan's idea is on what the gods are. Are they just archetypes? Are they just energies? Or do they have distinct personalities and whatnot? I think if you're dealing with the Irish pantheon at all, you learn quite quickly that at least they have personalities because we're all talking about the same people. Like It's very clear, but I'm not going to fight over this. Yeah. I think if more people would just adopt the five-year-old on the playground mentality, mm -hmm. as I like to call it, it's the, oh, you like spending time commuting in nature? I like spending time commuting in nature. We're friends. It needs to be that simple. Yeah. Because when it comes to a broader term like pagan, same thing with magic, same thing with some of these other broader, much broader terms, they're broader terms that many actually fall under it. It's not until we start getting down the nuance. Like I said, it's as many Venn diagrams that overlap each other. And life just would be so much easier if we would just see that and accept that. Because then the distinction is, oh, are you practicing this particular thing or this particular thing that is all within pagan? The most upsetting thing that I can say about this whole thing is I have faced more persecution. I mean, outright persecution and vitriol from pagans and my spiritual life than I have from Christians. And that is mind-numbingly upsetting. That, I mean, that just, it, it hurts my brain in a way that I am not fully capable of expressing in words that that is true. So for me, I've, I kind of understand how this can happen only because this is a pattern that repeats itself over oh, yeah. and over and over again for millennia. This is the first steps of a rise of an imperial dot, 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 whatever it is, imperial church, imperial whatever, is as a group forms and they start struggling for power, they start attacking those that don't conform to whatever rigid thought structure is involved. See, it's not even about rigid mm -hmm. thought structure, really, because anytime you're forming a group, there are two ideas that immediately pop up that do need to be answered. And that's who's on the inside of the group and who is on the outside of the group. Now, the outside of the group does not have to be an enemy, though we often do turn them into enemies or label them as such. That is a choice that does not have to be made. That is one of the big points of folly, really. But we can and should be mindful that anytime you start anything, if you start a coven, you will, you have to define who's in and who's out of the coven. If a friend has a witchy friend that is coming to visit and you're planning a ritual for that night, you might let them attend. You might not. Those may be coven only events. So you have to add, answer those questions, right? Who is in and who is out? So any group that forms has to answer that basic question. 
it is literally a gatekeeping question. Who is allowed in and who is kept out? That's natural. That's not an instinct that we need to fight against. The instinct we definitely need to be fighting against is making that entryway so narrow that either no one can come in, because that's happened to some groups. Look at the Shakers. The Shakers made that door so narrow. You had to believe that this one particular person was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ and that was the dot, dot, dot. Oh, and you can never have sex again for the rest of your life. They get really narrow. Like who's allowed into this door? They like, are really narrow. And that's why they're not a thing anymore. So you get to watch narrowing it too much. You have to also worry about opening it up too wide because if the label is too wide and anybody can fit in, then what is the usefulness of the label? When I say that the Buddhists, Shinto, Taoists, and the rest have been called pagans over time, that's not me saying that we should say that all Buddhists are pagans. Buddhists are Buddhists. But if a Buddhist identifies as a pagan, and some do, I've met quite a few pagans in my life that practice Buddhist meditation and the, the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas are part of their pantheon. Okay, you're, you're in the bus. Like, you can be a Buddhist pagan. You can be a Taoist pagan. You can just be a Taoist, you can just be a Buddhist, that's fine. We need to have that room within what we're doing to allow all the people in. Now, you and your particular group, if you're creating a Nordic group, or if I were to create a Bridget prayer circle, we're going to do specific things dedicated to the goddess Bridget. Well, that door is going to be very small. You have to, one, believe in the goddess Bridget and be willing to participate in whatever we're going to be doing. No one else need apply. That makes perfect sense because it's a small group do, doing small things, right? Paganism is a large movement and needs to have broad and large definitions. I get it. We're in a period where everything's up in the air. We're feeling out. What do we think about all the things now? You know, the disease that most platforms still don't like you to speak its name that had us all stuck in our house for a while there caused a lot of people to start questioning all the various aspects of their lives. And that questioning period hasn't shaken out yet. So I get it. I understand. But we can't make these definitions too narrow. And a big part of that is you got to know your history, especially if you're reclaiming a word that was used against you. Because what you got to ask, is it worth you in trying to reclaim that word? And I think bacon is a perfectly fine word to try to replay. Some of the other words that they call, but mm, no. But I think pagan is a fine word to try to reply. We just need to do it, I think, a bit more thoughtfully than I see some in the community doing. I hope I, we don't ever have to do another episode like this ever again. <laughs> Though, if we do, it will probably be over a specific incident that needs to have attention drawn to it. This just being very open and frank about it, because I really don't think that this should have to be repeated. But if, if, if incidents keep happening, if... I load up my social media and just sigh and close it because the arguments are happening again. It's what spurred this topic, making it onto the list. And that's why we called it, do we really know what a pagan is? Yes. Yes, we do. And there are many, 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 many pagans out there. Far more than use the name for themselves. Yeah. Many that don't even know it. They're, yeah. they're in the closet and it's okay. It's not our job to pull them out. They will come out when they're ready. I don't even think some of them were in the closet. I think some of them were just lost in the clothes. Like, they don't even know. Yeah, yeah, they don't even know they're in the closet. Because a lot of them have the mental constructs and all that negativity blocking them from yeah. even being able to consider. They even pull out from the clothes and go, oh, I'm in a closet. And then open the door and be like, hey, world. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a journey that is personal. And Everybody gets taken at their own seat. You have to respect that. But yes, yes, we do know. And there are many... Alrighty, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I, I, I don't like doing these more, I don't know if this is necessarily a negative episode. It feels like it is because I feel, I feel like I've got my, you know, wagging finger out and I, I don't like having my wagging finger out, but there's been a couple of times here recently where I've loaded up social media and just rolled my eyes, said my beasts and just shut it down because I saw these debates happening. I just can't. So wanted to put some out there into the world. And I'm sure everyone is going to be very kind and polite in the comments on this one. If you're listening to us either on YouTube or Spotify, you can leave a comment right there and we will see it and be able to respond. If you're listening to us anywhere else, 
even if it says you can leave a comment there, they don't notify us. So you can leave a comment there because engagement is amazing. But head over to creationsfast.com, click on chat. You leave a comment there. We'll be able to see it, respond, and have a conversation with you. While you're there, if you have a few dollars, you can pass our way. You can think about becoming a member. By the way, for the next couple of days, Substack is going to be giving away free gift subscriptions to our newsletter to those who are already subscribed, free paid subscriptions. If you get an email from them saying that you have a gift subscription, if you follow that up, you get to have a free month and we get paid as if you would paid for the subscription. So if you get one of those emails, please go through the motions if you would, because it helps us out a little bit. We get a small monthly donation from that and it really does help us out a lot. You can also support us over on Kofi and Patreon. I'm CE Dorset on both. All that money does is help us to keep a roof over our heads, lights on, and food on our tables. So thank you to everybody who does that. All righty. And remember, celebrate what you love and that which you hate. You should probably take some time for self-reflection because really you shouldn't be wasting energy hating anything. Yeah. <laughs> on that note, I really don't even know what the prayer should be for this one. So I'm going to pray to Mother Donna. Mother Donna, the great flow that moves to the world the mother of all of the gods, the mother of our great mother earth. Grant us the peace and the understanding and the clarity to understand that we should live together in fellowship one with another and not breed strife amongst ourselves, especially over petty and pointless living. Amen. Amen. Amen.